great. So we're going to get going here. Um, uh, today is uh, with regrets um, the uh, final uh, lecture of our course, and we're going to begin um, uh, a topic today that we don't have time to flesh out in detail, but um, is going to fill in some uh, bits of understanding about way some of the concepts we introduced earlier in the course um, uh, interact with uh, the availability of, of data from the world, such as we increasingly get from elements of big data, the, the data sources I characterized in our last lecture um, as being marked by uh, four Vs. On the one hand, uh, velocity, uh, volume, variety, and veracity. Um, we're going to be talking today specifically about something that has some overlap with what we talked about last time. Last time we spoke about how we could use some of this, this big data or other aspects of data coming in from the world over time together with simulation models to allow us to, to get a sense from, as to what's going on in the model. What, what are the values of different state variables within the model, different stocks? S, E, I, R, uh, for example, in the model we were looking at. What's their likely values? You get a distribution of them. That was particle filtering, so sequential Monte Carlo method, a method for taking this data, combining it with a model, and you usually get to kind of get an understanding, an improved probabilistic understanding about, about what's likely happening out there in the world. The technique we're going to be talking about today, called state space embedding, has a bit of the flavor of that as well, in the sense that it's connected with model dynamics, or connected with dynamics of a complex nonlinear system. And it has to do with taking data from the world and and, and giving us insight into that system. But today's discussions are different from Tuesday's in that they don't deal with a particular model. What we're gonna be talking about today is a means of taking data from the world, data over time specifically, and using that data to directly gain insight into the structure of state space, the structure of the system that gave rise to that data the structure of the processes out there in the world, whether we model them or not, which are giving rise to the data that we do observe. Because as we'll see, sometimes there's data from the world that looks hideously complicated, it looks almost random. And yet, if you, if you study it with a clear enough lens, the lens of state space reconstruction, we may find that there's actually hidden order behind it. There's a hidden logic to it, which is, which is there. If only we can recognize it using these methods. So just to remind us of elements of this, um, of the foundational concepts, you may remember that in this room, not three months then, I introduced the concept of state space. And state space basically characterized uh, a way of, of, the, of describing model evolution that was quite different from time plots. You know, often we create, for a given system, we create a plot over time of one or more variables of that system. Maybe one or more stocks of an SEIR model. State space provided a different way of, of visualizing that same information that has, had a focus on the state of the system. And within this uh, alternative mechanisms, we might have a model like this and uh, a model with, with three stocks. And the, the resulting state space would have three axes associated with it, one for each of the stocks, one for each of these elements of the state. So the susceptible would have an axis associated with it, the infective would have an axis, and the number of, of temporarily immune individuals would have a would have an axis. And at a given point in time, 
the model, this, this model would have a particular number associated with the susceptible stock. It would have a, hold a particular value. I would hold a particular value. TI, TI1 would hold a particular value. And that would correspond in state space to a point, a point with a particular coordinate along each of the axes, right? Just like we can have a three-dimensional plot X, Y, and Z, and a given point in that space has a particular y value of X, of Y, and Z. So, so it is at a given point in time, the system will be at a certain point in the state space. And over time, its state will evolve within the state space. It may play out in this sort of way, curving around and approaching. What, what lies here? If I showed you a picture of that on an exam, what would you say lies at the heart of the spiral? A what? An equilibrium, a point of stasis, a point where the system's in balance. You notice as it approaches it, it's changing less and less dramatically, and it's going to come into a point where if it reaches it, it doesn't change at all. So this is a state-space depiction of the system right here. It depicts the behavior of that same system within state space. And we can imagine a generalization of it, which depicts a set of all possible behaviors within the, the state space. We're going to take a look, ladies and gentlemen, how a set of models, which I've provided you several of them for download, and I'd like you to go to the Moodle site and download them now. They're, they're in a file called something like Models for State Space Lecture. There, it's a zip file. You should be able to download it. We're going to see how the structure of state space underlying data, structure of the state space associated with the process that gives rise to data, is whispered to us within that data. The data that comes from a real world system. Maybe it's count of cars per five minute period that cross the, the bridge from downtown Saskatoon over here to the side of the university. Maybe it's the count of arrivals every 15 minutes in an emergency room. Uh, maybe it's the number of births each day in Saskatoon. Um, maybe it's the number of sales that a company makes on each day successively of a given product. Each of those time series, it turns out, whispers to you of the full structure of state space. It, it intimates to you what's going on in the process that gives rise to it. Not just about one variable, but about a full set of variables. Not just about one output that we're showing, but everything that is coupled with, everything that drives it as well. Okay? So I'd like you to download that, and we're going to open some of these. And I'd like to first open the one called the Lorenz Attract. Okay, the Lorenz attractor. Um, I happen to have it open, so I'm going to, whilst you're um, opening that, I am going to actually go forward a few slides to a point where I depict the Lorenz attractor in time and in state space. Okay. So my boss is here. Let me let me find out what's going on. Give me give me a second. Maybe she wants to learn about state space. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, that's great. For two seconds outside. Okay. Um, at the end of the lecture, right like now. Now. Oh, okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, open that model up. And in fact, open up a couple of these models while you're waiting. Okay. Um, uh, the, the the different models that were in there. Um, uh, if we could. Um, if we could open them up, uh, that would be great. Okay. And we also need to speak to Willie, please. Here. Good, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, sorry for the intermission. Um, here, so so this um, uh, this uh, slide here depicts the first of these models, which is called uh, the Lorenz attractor. Uh, I have it depicted here um, within uh, any logic. Um, you folks should have uh, loaded it in by now. It has three stocks here. Um, it has uh, a set of three parameters associated with it. And when we run it, we're going to be looking at a set of graphs that are two-dimensional projections of the, the state two. So x versus y, x versus z, and uh, y versus z uh, over here on the left. And I'd like you to, to go ahead and run that now, OK? So if we go run um, the Lorenz attractor, you should find that um, it, uh, as it runs, it will depict uh, some behavior within each of these uh, state space uh, projections. And you could, in fact, if you wanted to do so, um, graph out each of these stocks as well that, that comes through it. And if you graph these stocks, you'll find that they look fairly random. They don't, they don't seem to, to have any particular pattern associated with them. It looks kind of like up and down and up and down and in a fairly stochastic fashion. And um, that's not true just for, for, say, X. If we were to go for Z here and look at it, it also looks fairly, uh, fairly random. And even over the course of, of longer periods of time, you would find that, that it's a fairly uh, random set of changes um, shown here, X, Y, and Z, that are But behind it, ladies and gentlemen, is a structure, it turns out, OK? Um, we have, for example, for the X and Y uh, phase plane, something like this, or, or the X and Z, or the Y and Z. Um, we see here that, that if we look at elements of state space, there's actually a lot of order there. This may look, um, X, Y, and Z may look quite random, but behind it lies something whose structure is, is actually quite clear if it's hard to describe uh, easily it's still it's still obviously ordered you have these kind of two lobes and you have the system going on each lobe for a while and then it switches over to the other lobe the other mode of the system um now it turns out that each of these x y x x z and y z is a projection down from a more complete space, state space, so a, a three-dimensional state space for the system. Why three-dimensional? Because there's three stocks, X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and here we see these, these two lobes and arranged in a sort of uh, order here. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is, is um, those basic facts, the kind of apparent randomness associated with the, um, the output from each of these stocks, but the orderliness, the regularities associated with, with each of these fa uh, state space presentations. But what I want to show you is something that is more intriguing yet. If you scroll down, you'll notice that I plot something different there. I plot here a value not of one of the state variables versus another. Um, that, after all, is the focus of, of these plots here. Um, uh, but rather, I'm plotting just one of them, x, versus the previous value of x, the x just one step ago. One, in this case, it's one time unit ago, I think. Um, and you'll see something that is also ordered. You know, the individual values of x, look, look not particularly clear in any, in any particular pattern. But 
from plotting x on the x-axis versus previous x on the y-axis, we see something that looks structured. Now, does anyone see, if I plot this out, x versus its previous value in a two-dimensional plot, does anyone see something that looks a little bit like it? But if I looked at this, this graph in black, is there another graph that looks kind of like it somewhere else on this screen? Sorry? Yeah, x and y. So somehow, and this is, this is the, the heart of the idea, somehow just looking at x by itself, we're getting something that looks a lot like x, so and look at x versus previous x, we're getting something that looks like x versus y. And it turns out it's a reflection of the fact that the information about x actually tells us about y. And in fact, the information about x, if we really look into it, will tell us about z, too. Why is that? Well, x is not evolving on its own. It's evolving with, with um, some interactions from y. It, 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 y is affecting x. And it turns out what that's saying is that information about y is going to be encoded in the value of x. x actually tells us something about the value of y. Okay? Um, so this is the heart of what we're going to be talking about today, how data from just one variable from the world can actually tell us about many aspects of a system if we learn to listen to it in the right way. It's whispering. We just need the right, the right microphone to, to sort of amplify those whispers, and it can tell us about a broader system. And it turns out here it's not just about y, but also about z. It tells us about the whole system, it turns out, because the whole system influences x. Okay. Um, and we're dealing with situations where the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, where we have this coupling. Okay, so I'm, I'm leaving that one. I am going to go now, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to open another one of these um, models that I've given you. And it's going to be a, a model that is called uh, uh, Hares, Lynx, Predator, Prey. Okay? Now, this model's somewhat like a model you folks worked on. Gophers and coyotes. Remember that? Gophers and coyotes. Um, so here we have hares, here we have lynx, and here we have um, each one influencing the other. Why, why do I say that each influences the other? Give me, give me a, a reason for saying that hares influence lynx. How, do, how does a hair influence a lynx? Good. Okay, they won't die off. Uh, they'll die. Off, uh, they'll die off if they don't get something to eat. Yeah. If there's lots of hairs, they won't die off as quickly. Okay. Good. Um, how about vice versa here? Why? Why would lynx influence hairs? Good. Yeah, exactly. So if there's a lot of hairs around, a lot of links around, it's it's gonna really make it hard for the hairs to survive, and so it'll probably reduce their numbers uh, very considerably. Hard to make, hard to allow them to grow, and so on. And what I'm going to tell you is that uh, if we were to look at this model um, and we were to graph it, what we would find is that. Um, uh, we could see uh, dynamics that are similar to what we saw uh, from the um, uh, fr from the uh, previous model, from the Lorenz attractor, in the sense that we see just one variable telling us about the others. So here we go. We're, we're plotting the number of hairs, and we're plotting the number of links. And this model has some differences from the one you were working with, but here we see oscillations. Oscillations. Can anyone give me a, a narrative here? Like um, the number of hairs is in uh, gray, the number of lengths times 100 is in red. Okay, so um, 10,000 for lengths uh, as marked by the axis would actually be 100 lengths. It's, it's, it's 100 times the actual value of chunk. So can anyone tell me why is it we see these oscillations? What's going on? 
Why is it the hairs, for example, go up and then go down, and then go up again? Give me, give me a narrative behind this. Give me a feeling for why we see this. For example, at this point here, let's say time uh, 210, the number of hairs is rising. Why is that? Yeah, the number of links is, is pretty low at that point, at, at time 210. Um, by contrast, uh, fast forward a bit to something like time, maybe this is 250 or something. The number of, or say say 275, or sorry, no, that's not that. It's like 217. The number of hairs is decreasing quickly. Why is it decreasing quickly? Yeah, the links are really high. There's lots of links around, right? Knowing about the value of, how, or knowing about how hairs are changing, that it's going up, tells us something about links. Hairs are rising quickly. It means that links are what? Speak all. Speak as in one voice. Yeah. So if, if hairs are running, uh, rising rapidly, probably there's there's not a lot of links around. If hairs are dropping quickly. It probably means there's a lot of links around. So the dynamics of hairs tells us about links. And it, it turns out the reverse is true. If lengths are rising rapidly, what is it telling us about hairs? There are a lot of them around to feed the links, right? Now, let's go here, look beyond this, though. I know some of you were playing with injecting links and, and so on, and I, I, won't, I won't stop that. Oh, man, why, why am I not able to scroll this nicely? Um, let me just uh, go, and I'm going to frob the simulation settings here so I can engaging panning behavior. Okay, so um, come on. Um, I, I'm going to zo enable zoom and pan in the window section. I thought that was enabled, but um, I was mistaken. Okay, so here we go. And we're running the model. Um, we see this play out over time. Uh, each of the variables tells us something about the other. Take a look at elements of the state space. Here's the here's state space. I could ask you this in the final exam, for example, um, in this very room. Um, and here's hairs versus lengths, right? We have hairs on the x-axis, lengths on the y-axis. And it's a big circle. Why is it circular? Because it's, yeah, it's also it's periodic, right? It keeps them coming back, back, it's like Groundhog Day. Um, it's like hair day. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, but alternatively, we could plot out hairs versus hairs at the previous time. And what do we see there? Well, it's, it's kind of like a stretched, squished version of this guy. What I'm telling you is that hairs by itself is telling us about the full state space. Links by itself is telling us about the full state of space. That it turns out, just listening to one of them whispers about the other. Whispers because change in the one we look at, for example, is, is tells us a lot about the values of the other. So I think you get some of the ideas here, ladies and gentlemen. Whether it's the Lorenz attractor or other components, we're getting a lot of information from, um, uh, from, from one of these uh, time series about the other. Okay, now um, I could go on to some details of, of, of state space and using it to depict um, possible outcomes, but I want to um, actually talk about this issue of, of getting insight more directly from, from data from the world. And I want to particularly focus our attention on systems that, like the ones we've just been looking at, are what we would call coupled nonlinear systems. Coupled because we see the different variables interacting with each other. Those, those variables are not evolving independently, they're actually tied in with, with each other. Secondly, they're nonlinear because there are these terms where it doesn't depend on just one of the state variables, but multiple state variables in ways um, 
that are, are technically nonlinear. The classic case of this in an SIR model is what? Where do we see a nonlinear term in an SIR model? Anyone? Anyone? Where do we see a nonlinear term in SIR? Sorry? So S and I, right? We have this um, infection term, remember that? Force of infection? Um, we would, we would have, for example, S times C times I over N times beta. Remember that? This would be the number of what? The number of people infected over time, right? Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's go to that. Um, so... Here, we have a nonlinear term in the fact that S times I is multiplied by I. The, the rate of change of S depends on I. Rate of change of I depends on S. Or put another way, we need both S and I to be able to uh, determine the, the values here. So ladies and gentlemen, we're dealing often with these nonlinear um, these nonlinear systems and the, the, the predator prey system is in the same uh, state. Okay. Um, so when we have these coupled nonlinear systems, um, a given state variable like S or the number of hairs depends on the others. It depends on the number of links or in the, in the um, uh, Lorenz attractor, we had Y depending on, or x depending on y and z as well, okay? Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, here we're going to be dealing with these systems that are coupled. And the fact that one of these variables evolves in a fashion that's entangled with the others means that in, in some sense it encodes information about the others, okay? So let's go see algebraically how this comes out. It sounds sensible from what we've been saying that the change in hairs tells us about the number of links and the change in links, like if it's dropping quickly, it tells us there's few hairs. But how does it actually work in terms of the mathematics of it? Well, let's, let's take a look at a case. So the system we looked at then, like the system you solved earlier in this class, was of this form. We have predators and prey. Okay, um, uh, x and y, and the rate of change of x depends on x, but it also depends on, on y. So if x is, for example, hares, or for example, gophers, um, they have some birth rate alpha, but then they have some death rate that's not just beta, but beta times y, times the number of predators around. So each predator has a chance per unit time of catching that hair. So its chance of dying in the next little bit is dependent not just on a fixed constant, but on the number of predators around. Because each of those predators has a chance of catching it. It's got to evade each and every one of them. So it's minus beta times x, y. And for predators, their birth rate for what the model we had looked at in class and in, in the assignment uh, depends on the number of, of, of prey because they give big birth bigger litters of, of kits or whatever you call young lynxes um, if there's more prey around and they die at a fixed rate of health size. Okay. Now suppose we have this system. Now let's, uh, let's actually try, um, try just rearranging the term. So take the top equation here. Um, the rate of change of x equals alpha x minus beta xy. Great, so that's the rate of change. Let's take beta xy and take it on the other side and take x dot on the right hand side. So we have beta xy equals alpha x minus x dot and we can divide through by uh, beta x and we get something that says y equals alpha x minus x dot divided by beta x. Now, I would argue that in my neck of the woods, that's a very interesting thing. 
Why is this interesting? It's not just interesting because it could be on the final exam, but uh, it's interesting for another way. Why, why is that interesting? Yeah, it's, it's telling us if we know about x and its rate of change, we know how x's rate of change is you know, going up really quickly, x naught is really hot, and we know something about x itself, what its value is. Using that information, just some constants, we can figure out the value of y. We can, we can compute how many, how many lakes there are around, just on the number of, the number of hairs and the, and the rate of change of hairs. We can, it, it gives us the number of lengths. And similarly, if we only have information about lengths, we could derive what the value of hairs are. In other words, that information is encoded in, in the, the other variable. If, if you give me x, I can give you y. You give me y, I can give you x. Now this is a two-dimensional system. I mean, there's, there's two elements here, x and y. But I tell you, they're coupled in a way that if you give me a time series of one, I give you back the I can give you back the other. Because they're so coupled that it that it whispers about it. X, the number of hairs over time, whispers about the number of, of Y. So, ladies and gentlemen, here informationally it's encoded. The value of Y can be got from X, and the value of X can be got from Y. Now this is a model. This is a this is a this is a model we have here. But what I'm telling you is about systems in the real world, it's the same thing even if we don't have a model of them. The values we do measure, from the number of cars going over the bridge to Saskatoon, or the number of people coming in the ER, it's actually telling us about a lot in that one data set. It's telling us about a whole set of things that are influencing it. And it turns out we can get a structured depiction of that in a technique known as state space embed. We can get a depiction of the state space of the system, the full state space of the set of factors that are giving rise to that variable. That single variable we measure whispers to us about the whole system. It's like a, a hologram. You look at one thing, it, 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 it lets you see the whole thing in three dimensions, but what's what's there? Three or more dimensions. Okay, so, so the fact that we have these kind of coupled systems where one thing depends on the other, whether it's the Lorenz system, like we looked at before with those sort of odd, um, twisty um, lobes, or whether it's the predator-prey system, they're entangled enough that, um, that knowing about one tells us about the other. And I've, I've, I've tried to deal with the intuition here. Um, you know, another, another system which we've worked with is, is, is West Nile virus. And um, in there you have, um, does anyone know, um, what, what, what is it that gives people West Nile virus? Is it by eating snails? Mosquitoes. It's mosquitoes, ladies and gentlemen. And it turns out, that, where do mosquitoes get it from? They get it from they bite. The things they bite. But only certain other things that they bite. It turns out they don't get it from horses, and they don't get it from people. But they get it from another thing with wings. Or birds. They get it from birds. Okay. So, so it turns out mosquitoes pick up West Nile from birds, and birds pick up West Nile from, guess what? Mosquitoes. So those two are coupled, and then, then the mosquitoes sometimes bite people. Hopefully the birds don't bite people. <laughs> At least not outside of Hitchcock moments, right? Um, so so uh, ladies and gentlemen here, I would argue that like if we start to see a sudden rise in the number of cases of people with West Nile, it tells us something about how many mosquitoes are infected up there. It tells us something about how many birds are infected. It's probably probably a lot. It's probably a lot. So the key point here is these those are models, and, and that's fine. I'm, I'm using it to build intuition, start with simple systems. But the same thing is true with data from the world where we have no model yet. We don't have an understanding. This, this data from the world tells us about the system that gives rise to us and tells us what needs to be in that model if we're going to model it. It tells us what needs to be in there to account for the features. What are the key elements of the behavior of the system and state space that a model has to account for? Okay, so given an empirical time series for a variable from the world, one variable from the system, 
it encodes information about the broader state of the system that gives rise to it, that governs it, that, that influences it. And we can elicit these features. We can draw them out. We can study them using just the single variable x. Now, ladies and gentlemen, back to the 1980s. Okay. Um, in the 1980s, uh, a Dutch mathematician uh, called Floris Takens um, actually formally proved a way, he demonstrated a means, a systematic general means for doing exactly this, for, for sort of drawing out that information about the whole system from just one variable of the system over time, one, one time series of observations. Given that one time series, we can feed it into this Floris Takens machine, turn the crank, and we can get a picture of the state space of the system that gave rise to it. And it is awesome. It's an awesome means. It's straightforward. It's general, powerful. It's scalable to millions of data points, etc. It's actually a very simple procedure. And it involves something called uh, delay embedding. Okay, so the idea here, ladies and gentlemen, the idea here is that we have a time series of observations uh, from the world. And I'm gonna call that time series by, by tradition. Over in statistics, they call things you observe from the world why. Why they do that, I don't know, but, but that's, the, that's the variable they use, why, okay? And I'm imagining a time series which, uh, which consists of uh, a set of values over time. So we have y of zero. The mathematicians don't like that. They'd like to start with one. But maybe that's why we, we broke off. Um, so y of one, y of two, y of three, et cetera, right? Um, uh, y, of, y of four, um, et cetera. So we have a long time series of this. Maybe it's hundreds of thousands, maybe it's millions of time long. You know, this, this phone in the course of this lecture will record other hundreds of thousands of accelerometry data points for me, will record my orientation and my GPS location and proximity to Wi-Fi points, and millions of data points may come off of me whilst I'm delivering this lecture. And you can imagine just one of those, you know, like my, the, the X force of my accelerometer being listed out one after the other, a million, a, a, a vector, a million in length. Now, delay embedding is going to take this. It's going to take this long time series, observations over time, time zero, time one, time two, time three, and it's going to create from it a set of vectors in a, in a state space um, of dimension that we will call here, I call it N here. Sometimes we use E to detect, to, to talk about the embedding dimension. So from this, from this uh, time series, we will pull out these vectors. And the way in which we'll pull them out, we'll have a vector for, for a given vector that we built We'll get it from successive points in the time series, optionally separated by a fixed spacing greater than one. So, uh, for example, we might have y of t, y of t minus some fixed tau, t minus two tau, etc. So, I'm going to choose tau here for simplicity. Tau is going to be equal to one, and what that means is uh, we're going to have. Let's suppose that e or n, the the, the dimension we're reconstructing is three, okay? We're gonna have n equals to three here. We're going to pull out successive values um, uh, into, into this. So let's suppose I focus on time two, I'm going to have y of two, and then I would have y of what? This is t, tau equal one. So what is, what is this next one gonna be? y of what? y of one, y of two minus one, which is one, and then y of what? Zero, right? Two minus two times one, or two minus two, or zero. So, so this would be one of the points in the reconstructed state space. Another one of them would be y of three, 
and tell me the, so this is one of the vectors that comes out of reconstruction. So this is the first vector. What's the second vector? Y of three, what would come after that? What, y of two and Y of one. Okay. And I'll create one more vector from this times original time series. So I'm going to start with Y of four and what's the next one? Y of three and Y of two. Okay. So that would be a three dimensional reconstruction from this time series, three dimensional embedding from this time series. I create these vectors. If it were a two dimensional embedding, I get out, these are three vectors. They're vectors with three elements, they're in three dimensions. I, if it was two vector, I'd get out, I'd get out just two dimensional vectors. Give me the first one that, the first complete vector I can read out if they're in two dimensions. Okay. Yeah, y of one and y of zero. Okay, good. And the next one, y of two and one. Now, you may notice that this is quite similar to something, and you know we could just uh, continue to fill these in. This is a; these are two vectors. So they're two dimensional, two dimensional vectors. This is basically the same thing we were depicting. Do you remember that? Do you remember that, ladies and gentlemen? We we're depicting here for the Lorenz attractor, we were depicting for the hair's lengths when he ran it. Does anyone remember? What what does this correspond to? Like y of two and y of one. What well, how does that relate to something I showed you on the screen here? Well, yeah, yeah. Hairs and hairs minus versus hairs um uh, with uh, hairs of t and hairs of t minus one. Um, alternatively, uh, so, so these guys here, lengths and lengths of t minus 1. Alternatively, when we go to the Lorenz attractor here, we can run this, and we will see down at the bottom here, as this plays out, here we have x versus previous x, so x of t versus x of t minus 1. Those are just the... Those are just these vectors I've drawn here. So, so we're plotting as a point in this embedded space. We're plotting each of these vectors of, of reconstructed, you know, y of 2 and y of 1 being one vector, y of 3 and y of 2 being the second vector, etc. Um, that's what we're plotting out there. And we get something that looks like these other plots, the plots of the state space. And I would argue that that's exactly what's going on here. And that's what Taken's theorem says. That essentially, we are reconstructing the state space when we do this. We're reconstructing the state of the whole system by eliciting these vectors and plotting them out. We get a stretched, perhaps, picture of the full system. But it is as we say, diffeomorphic to it, it directly reflects the underlying structure of the system. Just as if we go here with let, uh, hair's lengths, predator prey, and we were to run it, there we go, we would see that these are each a stretched version of the sort of state space that is naively depicted Hairs versus hairs of t of minus one. It looks just like that, except that it's it's kind of squished and stretched in this kind of odd way, right? Um, but you have a one-to-one -one mapping between them. You can you can you can map to it in a way that's um, uh, that's uh, very well well structured and smooth. It 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 sort of carries over directly. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, the simple procedure of creating of taking a time series and creating vectors of it, of fixed length, created by looking at successive elements, optionally separated by something by more than one. So where tau is two, it's separated by two. Uh, where tau is four, separated by four, indices of four. Um, it turns out that gives us something that is directly related to. It's kind of a, it's basically a stretch version of the real state space of the full system. Now, the remarkable thing about this, ladies and gentlemen, to me it's remarkable, is that how is this? It's almost like 
if you looked at my fingerprint, you could see a full picture of my entire, you know, physical structure of my organs, my, my eye color, my, my hair color, and you knew exactly what it looked like. It was just through, through a little tip of, of, uh, of you know, the, uh, the bit of my uh, fingerprint. Um, it would be as if, you know, by uh, looking at a mark on the tire of a car, you knew everything about the structure of that car. But so it is with these coupled systems. They're, they're entangled enough that knowing about one part of it tells us about the other parts. And here, through the simple procedure of delay embedding, we can elicit the structure of the system through simply this procedure of taking a time series, y0, y1, y2, y3, etc., and creating from it a set of vectors in a, a fixed size where each of them is reconstructed from successive uh, elements of the uh, original time series. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, here we might do something for this Lorentz attractor that's in uh, three dimensions, not merely two. We took a look at, at two dimensions. But using the values from X alone, values from X over time, we might create not just a two-dimensional reconstruction, but a three-dimensional one. And that's what's depicted here. And, and the actual original, which I used to produce this, was rotatable, like you kind of move it around. And it has a structure very similar to what we see here. We have these kind of lobes with these kind of holes in the center. And all this is constructed just from one piece of the system. Data from one part of the system tells us about the system as a whole. Um, this is a little tool built by one of my students. This is, this is not the coolest tool. The coolest tool is an Oculus Ring, which you got to see. you got to see. You feed in a, a, a set of data, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of points. You put on the Oculus Rift, and you can see the three-dimensional state space that gave rise to it. It's, it's completely awesome. Um, you just regret having to take the goggles off. Um, uh, so. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here um, we're showing how a given plot with X can be used to create a state space. And this is actually showing, you know, far from, this is, th these are three different delayed versions of state space. This is X of T, this is X of T minus tau, X of T minus two tau. And that's used, those are used in turn to plot out this sort of depiction down here. This is data from heart rate variability, which can be used to measure stresses using um, smartwatches and, and vests and so on. And um, and you can plot out a structure in, in three-dimensional space that is implied by these time series, although it's not obvious for it. And that structure depicts the underlying dynamics of the system that gave rise to this, the state of other factors that, that gave rise to this. And this particular subset of it, which is shown in kind of this lighter color, corresponds to kind of a sub-area of this trajectory where the system is in a certain region of the state space. Um, and we can do that uh, from, from any types of, of time series and create these kind of elements of state space in three dimensions, which have this structure that's totally non-obvious from the original time series often. And it tells us about, uh, about this, uh, this structure. Now, it turns out that, um, that there's some exploration that's needed for this. And in fact, in the Oculus Rift version, anyone's interested in seeing that? Let me, let me know. Um, I can't do it for the final, but um, we could uh, do it at a later point. Um, it's down in 386. Um, uh, here, it turns out we have to pick values for certain parameters, tau and e. E being, or n being, the, the sort of uh, number of elements in each of these factors, the dimension of the embedding. Um, uh, are we embedding it in two dimensions, kind of like, like uh, this, this guy here? Are we embedding it in three dimensions? Uh, such as here, um, we got to pick that, and we have to pick the value of tau, which um, uh, it turns out can make a difference. 
you're getting data that's frequently sampled from the world. Like you're getting maybe heart rate data once every half second or something. Um, your heart rate's going to change kind of slowly compared to that for most circumstances. You know, it may change every few minutes as you shift position or get up and walk out of the lecture in disgust or whatever. But, um, but you know, it's not going to change immediately. So what that means is that a lot of the time, the value at time t is going to be very similar to the value at time t minus 1 and the value at time t minus 2. It's, it's not going to be much difference. And what that will lead to is a lot of points that lie along the diagonal axis. Why the diagonal axis? Why do I say they lie along here? What is it about that's special about the diagonal axis? What is it that's... All of the dimensions have the same value. Yeah, yeah. The, the value along each of the coordinates, no matter which coordinate you take, it's got the same value. So, you know... Along the y-axis, the diagonal axis would be one, 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 and two, 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 and three, two, three. Um, it's it's pointing up there um, in, in a way that um, the values of the different coordinates are going to be the same. And so, if we're if we're sampling from a system very frequently, we're frequently going to get the case that y of t and y of t minus one and y of t minus two will be at the same coordinates. Um, but if we use tau equal to 2, we'll start to expand that. There's a, there's a bigger chance that those will be different. Tau equal 4, tau equal 8, tau equal 16. So this is some, some real data we gave to it. And, um, and you can see that as you change tau, we get a more fulsome depiction of the underlying system, including these trajectories, which kind of zip around the outside part of, of the state space and some internal components in the core of the state space. So we're, we're kind of expanding out the time series um, more fully. Um, or here, tau equal one, tau equal two. And then you start to get some wilder structures with tau four and tau eight, okay? Um, sort of elicited from this. Now, this is all great, okay. So, so we elicit this embedding space. What's the big deal? What's the big deal here? Well, the big deal is several, it has several different big deals associated with it. The first thing is you can use it to recognize the fact there's hidden order behind the system. We, we talked earlier, you know, there's, there's um, uh, if, if, if we were to look at this, you, you see great complexity in these time series. You wouldn't know there's hidden order, but if you take even one of them, you could see, oh my my gosh, you know, there's there's actually something very regular behind it. This is not totally random. It's It has this order, and I should be able to understand it. I should be able to predict it better. I should be able to know where it's going. I should be able to, to uh, potentially change it in structured ways knowing about this. I should be able to model it in a way that captures this order. Incidentally, in a topic we didn't have time to explore, this system is not noisy. It is, does anyone want to use an, a word for it? It is, it's actually it looks stochastic. It's not, it turns out it's totally deterministic, but it is, hopefully this doesn't describe your life in the later part of the term. Begins with C. It is complex. I won't dismiss chaotic. It is chaotic, ladies and gentlemen. It, that's the formal term for it, is it's chaotic. It almost looks random. A small difference in where you are at, at a given time makes a big difference for later. If you're just slightly off, it makes make a big difference. It leads to what's sometimes called a butterfly effect. A small difference can lead in here, can lead to a big difference elsewhere and which are caused by positive feedbacks associated with the system. But here we can recognize um, by using this lens of embedding that, wait a minute, there's a hidden structure here behind this. This ain't random. This is, in fact, quite, uh, this is quite predictable. If only I have the right lens. And it can point us to ways in which we could model. A second advantage, it allows us to assess uh, this embedding allows us to assess the dimensionality of the system. Okay, um, 
It allows us to know how many state variables, if we want to model this system, how complex the system is, how many state variables do we need to really characterize it well? And I didn't put it down here. I really should. In fact, uh, with your pardon, I think I will. Um, it can allow us to predict the system because, look, depicting these trajectories in state space, we can predict, okay, you know, this is going in this certain place in state space where it's gone many times before. I, I, I can know where it's going to go over the next bunch of time. Um, I can anticipate where it's going to go by the structure of that state space. Whereas if I just looked at, you know, at a, at a given point here within the xy plot, I'm, I might be quite clueless of what it's likely to be over here or what it's likely to be here. Knowing about the state space, it tells me a little bit about where, what it's going to do long term. Um, and it allows me to understand something about a model. Now, um, a final component here, it is that it allows me to actually assess, and this is way powerful. It allows me to assess for different variables of a system, what is influencing what. This is totally not obvious, but the basic embedding that we just talked about allows us, if we have time series in two different variables, to now, say, call them x and y. Is y driving x? Is x driving y? Are both driving each other? Or are they merely correlated? They merely go up and down together because some other variable, z, is driving both. You know, the weather is driving, um, you know, driving you to, warm, to wear warmer pajamas at night, and it's it's leading to uh, people having heart attacks from from shoveling snow. Um, th those are, I would hope, not causally <laughs> related, um, but they are correlated, right? Uh, when you wore, when you wear warmer pajamas, it so happens that other people are are dying of heart attacks or or going to the emergency room for heart attacks, but they are unlikely to be causally related, um, and. We have a lot of issues when we try to study the world and knowing what things are just coincidental correlation and what things are actually causally driving one another. And this provides a structured way of knowing that exact thing. Um, it doesn't come immediately out of embedding, but it comes out of a process called convergent cross mapping with embedding. And the basic idea is we reconstruct from a given time series X, we're interested in time series X, and we have time series Y, we want to know Y influencing S. We build the state space from X, and we do it in a clever way for different sort of subsets of it. And we ask essentially, is that state space for as constructed from X allowing us to accurately predict the value of Y? Um, in a structured way. And, and that can allow us to know is why causally influencing that. It's not a statistical technique. It's a technique based on state space. State space, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, state space. Okay. Um, but I want to emphasize here, none of what we're talking about requires a model. None of what we're talking about requires simulation. These are features of the world, ladies and gentlemen. We build models to make better decisions in the world. We build models to learn about the world. We build models to help us reason about more about it and not work at cross purposes with the, the nature of things. And these tools leverage concepts we talked about in modeling, state space, to give us insights about the world that would otherwise be elusive. Yeah, predictive insights, insights about the structure of the systems. I don't have time to go into all of this, but I will tell you that collectively these techniques can see very powerful application when it comes to this age of big data that we've entered. What we have, because one of the defining characteristics of that, you may recall from last lecture, from the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity is 
velocity. What is velocity here? Yeah, how quickly you're getting your data. So in the big data space, maybe it's posts to Facebook pages, you know, once every, uh, the count of, of posts to Facebook pages here in Saskatchewan, once every minute. Um, or maybe it's data related to uh, the number of Twitter accounts mentioning um, influenza uh, gathered every half day. Or maybe it's uh, information related to the, uh, the number of calls to 911 of uh, reporting, uh, uh, reporting threats of physical violence once a day. Whatever these time series are, are coming from, they're often longitudinal. They, they evolve lots of data over time in a very dense way. From, from the smartphones, we get things, you know, every, um, every you know, few minutes, at least I'll get a GPS reading or I'll get a bunch of accelerometry readings, etc. All of these are long time series. And these methods provide a way of turning those time series into real insights about what's giving rise to them and to what we need to model them accurately. And these techniques provide us in this, in this reconstructed state space with something that our models can try to reproduce through the state spaces that they imply in the models. So they provide an additional criteria for calibration and validation of those models. It's a big area. Big data is a whole other sphere that, that can be combined with models in different ways. Models like the particle filter, but also be combined in ways that uh, allow us to better calibrate our models, uh, better cross-check our models, and inspire our models. We're entering, in short, ladies and gentlemen, a world um, of modeling that's very different from the world that, that was there when I was uh, starting modeling. Modeling um, allows us critically to go beyond description of the world to ask these what if questions about the world. If this were different, if that were different, if we were to put that extra bridge here in Saskatoon, if we were to launch this extra advertising campaign for our product or this new type of product offering, how might that change things in terms of the, the outcome indicators we're interested in? And the tools that we've explored in this class System dynamics modeling, agent-based modeling, discrete event modeling are all tools that individually and together in hybrid models combine us with ways of, of, of describing these systems in a world in a, in a articulate fashion, in a fashion that's expressive, concise, and clear and transparent for ourselves and for others. We pick different languages for the job. I use this term metalinguistic abstraction to describe it. We as computer scientists have this choice. That's an extraordinary choice. And it's a choice deprived most other fields, the vast majority of other fields. We can not only choose how to frame a problem using pre-existing formalisms and methods, we can develop our own ways, our own methods for describing systems. And system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and discrete event modeling are each languages built to describe certain classes of systems with certain properties. In the future, we're evolving new languages. My lab is building new languages for agent-based modeling. Because any logic is, is the least horrible of a set of options out there, but it's still Really bad in some respects. <laughs> um, in many respects. Um, now, we as computer scientists can choose, we can craft the tools we use to describe the world. We can craft the languages by which we characterize systems. And we can choose which language is best for a particular problem and weave them together in hybrid modeling in different ways. This class has provided glimpses of how to do that. This class, though, is really a, a it's a, it's a super, it's a, it's a beginning introduction. It, it gives a superficial glimpse of this. Superficial, not in the sense that it's, that it's too shallow, but it's a deep area. It's, it's, it's a good start, but it goes a lot deeper than that. And it's increasingly entwined with elements of big data, with elements of machine learning, such as particle filtering, etc. 
Um, I'm hoping that uh, that the tools that come out of the class will be ones that you'll find helpful in reasoning about problem domains that you go into. Perhaps some of you will encounter more work in formally building models. Others may use simulations in your jobs and other contexts. And it bears in mind noting the limitations of simulation. If I were to exhort you with a few you know, leaving thoughts about simulation, it's to remember that simulation is a learning tool, not a black box. It's not a crystal ball that allows us to predict things for perfection in the world or it's false and shatters. Rather, it's a learning tool. It's a, turn, it's a tool to help us learn more effectively. Because we as people are not very good about reasoning about complex systems in our heads. And even the very sharpest amongst us, the Einsteins of the world, it turns out have quite poor intuition when it comes to complex systems. Just like we need crutches to get around when we've broken our foot, we need simulation models to get around reliably reasoning about complex systems because uh, without them we fall flat in our face intellectually and in understanding those systems and managing them much as we would without crutches we fall flat in our face um, without them to support us. And we must always be humble. We must always represent, understand the fact that models are approximations, they capture hypotheses about the world, and they're best used to test those hypotheses, to help falsify them, to help challenge them, and to quickly remedy them when we fall them, find them falling short. They're tools, in short, not to present one way the world must be and operate within those constraints, but to ask how is the world and to, to build in to learn from observations of inconsistency with the model and to improve it over time. And models are one of these tools that can be often misused, particularly for people who have never taken a class like this. You provide a model in front of them, and their natural inclination is to think of it as a crystal ball and to trust it. Or to say it's too, it, it's, it's too frail, I'll, I'll throw it out. We have to introduce this notion of, of models as, as learning, uh, learning tools and this need to be cautious when we give someone a model to help them understand what are its legitimate uses and what are uses for which it's not, it's not well put. Another thing I'll leave you with is that within the modeling space, there's tremendous tribalism. This may be the only class in the world, only class in the world, not in a formal academic institution, where all three approaches are taught. Most classes which teach simulation model teach one of these. Discrete modeling alone, system dynamics alone, and Asian-based modeling alone. And I know it's a lot to take in, but these have more in common than they have in differences. They're more, more similar in what they're seeking to achieve um, then they are different in, in their formalisms. They are different. We use each of them for different areas, discrete event modeling for characterizing systems where we're interested in flow through defined processes, uh, particularly in terms of throughput, latency. We're interested in waiting times or size of waiting lists. Uh, we're interested in, in capacity-limited systems and the impact of resources and resource placement. System dynamics were we use to describe feedback-rich systems with accumulations using these mechanisms of stocks. We use them to characterize the, the high-level dynamics of systems um, by aggregating away from the details and reasoning about the behavior of the systems in ways that, that clue us in to equilibria behavior, clue us in to stability, clue us in, in, in many cases, to to aspects of tipping, uh, tipping points of the system. Asia-based modeling, we focus on systems where we're interested in agent-agent agent interaction and interaction with the environment in effective ways. We've, we're interested in, in how the collective behavior of agents give rise to high-level behavior that we see. But all of them 
allow us to ask what if questions. All of them allow us to, to anticipate what might come later. All of them allow us to assess the sensitivity of our assumptions to, to variables. All of them allow us to, to calibrate to external data. All of them demand from us consistency of our dimensions to make sense of the model. Just as in a system dynamics model, it is meaningless to add something that's measured in persons to something that's persons per unit time. To add one to two and to get a single number out is meaningless. So it is meaningless in a discrete event model and so meaningless also in an in a, uh, agent-based model. System, uh, all of these model types are further artifacts of software engineering. They are human creations that need to be crafted, need to be maintained, and often need to be communicated. And by virtue of that, we have to build them carefully. We have to build them in a way that the people who care about them can understand so that we can secure buy-in, we can secure confidence, we can secure um, conviction by them that this is a is a model well crafted, that it's it's got thoughtful uh, and well grounded um, understanding behind it, and so they can look at it and critically provide feedback on it. And this is very similar in many ways to requirements for software projects. Some of you have had the you can have the misfortune or fortune of having taken other of my courses in software engineering. 371, for example, perhaps 470. Um, in those courses, I emphasize certain common themes. Building software so it can be understood. Software so that it can be maintained. Software that's, that's transparent, that's easily extendable. Software that abstracts away from the details of the numbers in the code and, and captures things in well-named variables so that we can easily change them at one place. Software that uses the right abstractions from the job. Has the right building blocks to describe the system well. And uses the right languages for the job. Golang, JavaScript, C++, Scala, Java, Prolog, Haskell, wherever your palette, you use the right language for the job, much as you do with simulation model. And it's about delivering value to stakeholders. Software projects, as well as modeling projects, are often play out within the human feature. They have to secure buy-in to be continued, to be funded. All the best technical dreams in the world can end up for naught if you don't have stakeholder buy-in and willingness to support them. And software engineering and modeling require a recognition of this, of this human theater and a recognition that we need to get stakeholder buy-in. And both of them are often pursued in the same incremental way. You build the model, you build software, you take it in front of someone with a small number of elements, you get their feedback, you incorporate the feedback into the model. With models as well as software, people often don't know where they want to go exactly. And it's not until they see it that they really understand what they've requested thus far and realize, oh, that's actually not quite what they need. Often until they see a model running, they don't remember they know certain things. It sounds bizarre, but we have such tacit knowledge in our heads. We forget we know something until we see something that contradicts it. And we say, oh, oh yeah, I never told you that, but you know, uh, that, that's the pattern we used to see, or that's, that's very different from what we see. Software and models are built in this increment, best built in this incremental, iterative, agile style. And even more so than normal software, from models we learn from them along the way. We not only learn what took longer, what, what was faster, how the te which technologies are stable, which are not, like we do in software as well. But we also learn, we correct our thinking, and we use that thinking to, um, to develop our, and refine our understanding more, uh, more carefully. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks much. Um, so ladies and gentlemen,
simulation modeling is uh, an approach which um, is playing out within the human theater and within the theater of computer science. And I hope that the lessons of this course will suit you, um, suit you well for your careers in whatever areas of computer science you wish to, you wish to uh, pursue. If anyone um, is interested in learning more about practical applications of modeling, I'd be glad to uh, to speak with them. Um, we have a lab uh, here, and indeed a, a program which is, whose graduates are sought out uh, across the world. Um, we have uh, quite a few that have uh, gone to Australia on internship, um, gone in and secured modeling placements across Canada and across the world. Um, we also have sets of events which bring together people who desperately need this sort of modeling from around the world with, with students from this program who have graduated with knowledge how to build these models. And where it's like a one week hackathon to, to pull together models that, that speak to the needs of these stakeholders, which often then turn into job opportunities or internship opportunities or opportunities to uh, to have uh, funded lines of research uh, after the event. It's a big area. It's an area where demand far outstrips supply. My lectures on these topics have gathered hundreds of thousands of video views. Um, uh, each lecture I give here to this, to this group, which is a, my primary concern, is, is also linked to very commonly by, by thousands of other viewers within a year or two. And um, it's my great pleasure and privilege to have worked with you folks in person. Um, this is an area of, of personal passion for me. Um, and uh, if it's something where you're interested in learning more, um, I'm always glad to, uh, to share comments and opportunities. Um, now, uh, later, uh, later this afternoon, uh, we're going to be holding our, our um, exam review session. The exam review session will be held in Thorvaldsen 128. Okay? Um, uh, it will last approximately two hours in length. Um, and I will be going systematically through a set of topics that are of central importance to this class. I will further be uh, talking some about the structure of the exam. I will do my very best to make sure that that lecture is recorded and posted um, within an hour of finishing it. Some of you might not be able to make it, so I'll just say a few words here. The exam is being offered in this room. The exam is closed book. The exam is electronic. It will be taking place on machines in front of you. Um, the, uh, the exam is, by default, uh, three hours. Um, and uh, the questions will be predominantly short answer with some long answer questions. I had hoped, but the tech staff were not able to uh, put the, the magic together of time to have some model building questions using any logic as part of it. Plan, one of the goals for having on this computer, but that will have to wait until next year. Um, however, uh, you will be able to type. I will have you, when you come in to, the, uh, to this exam, I'll be walking you through how you sign in, take the <coughs> exam on it, and the exam will be submitted to me electronically. I will be here all through the exam to answer questions okay, and, and offer to help out. Um, uh, the exam review session, um, I had hoped to have in place a set of sample questions for it. Um, the exam being so soon, it's, I know it's, it imposes a hardship for you, it imposes a hardship for me. And I'm scrambling to get together some example questions prior to the exam. Um, I will do my best to get those to you tonight, but it competes with delivering the review session. And um, I think I'm gonna be able to get them to you. Um, a final comment. I'm also hoping to be here prior to the exam for at least half an hour, ideally an hour, in this room for any students who have questions. If you want to come ask questions at the last minute, I'm glad to answer them. Otherwise, I'll be holding a review session immediately, followed by the uh, exam 
the formal exam review or be holding office hours now. Okay. The office hours uh, now will be, for other reasons, uh, over in my office. And then I will uh, be returning to uh, Thorvaldson 128 in order to, uh, uh, to deliver the review session. So uh, that's all for now. Uh, thank you for your attention today. And thank you for your participation in the class. Um, I appreciate your many contributions, points of feedback, and uh, bearing with uh, class irregularities and weirdness of audiovisual over the semester. Thanks very much, and I would look forward to seeing many of you for office hours and for the exam, um, the final exam review session. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, I think Boyle said he emailed you yes. that the That's written right. portion says that he would take some more time. That, Is that possible? I don't know. Um, so, so I received an email from him uh, earlier, and um, uh, so pardon me while I just uh, figure out a puzzling thing here. But um, yeah, so he had... Um, uh, he had sent along a, um, a an email which uh,